King Arthur, Chapter 3. This is on page 431 of your textbook. Merlin foresees that Arthur's illegitimate son, Mordred, will kill Arthur. The Lady of the Lake gives Arthur her sword, Excalibur. Arthur marries Guinevere, even though Merlin foresees that she and Sir Lancelot will love each other more than they will love Arthur. King Arthur was a born leader. Despite his youth, he possessed the qualities necessary in the best of knights, strength, courage, and skill. He also possessed the qualities necessary in the best of kings. He met arrogance with self-confidence and pride, yet treated the weak and poor with sympathy and understanding. He was a father to the young and a comfort to the old. He was strict with those who acted unwisely or unlawfully, yet he was generous and courteous to all. He used his wisdom, his strength, and his treasure to improve the lives of his people. His subjects loved him. His kingdom brought him fame from the early days of his reign, and he towered above the other kings of his time. However, many powerful dukes and barons resisted King Arthur's effort to unify Britain. He had to conquer the outlying parts of his kingdom by force of arms. With Merlin to advise him, King Arthur spent the first years of his reign subduing the dukes of northern Britain, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. He sailed to Iceland and added that island to his kingdom. During this time, he met and loved King Margoese, the, the wife of King Lot of Orkney. Only later did Merlin reveal that she was Arthur's half-sister. God is angry with you, for you have slept with your sister, and she has given birth to your son, who will destroy you and all of the knights in your kingdom. It is your destiny to die in battle against him as punishment for your foul deed. Merlin advised King Arthur to save his life by collecting and secretly killing all the male children of noble blood who had been born on the day Margoese gave birth. Given the penalty of death for withholding such a child, many infants arrived at King Arthur's court. He put them all into a small boat and sent it out to sea. He expected that the infants would drown, or if by chance the boat remained afloat, that they would surely die of exposure or starvation. The small boat crashed on the rocks by a castle and broke apart. Unknown to Merlin and Arthur, Arthur's son survived the catastrophe and was rescued by a good man, who named him Mordred and reared him to the age of fourteen. Then Mordred returned to the household of his mother and King Lot, where he trained with their four sons to become a knight. Arthur always believed that Mordred was one of his nephews. When King Arthur's subjects learned of their children's deaths, they were outraged. Many blamed Merlin. One day, soon thereafter, Arthur was riding in the, in the forest when he saw three peasants pursuing Merlin. Arthur forced the peasants to flee and said to Merlin, You would have been killed if I had not happened to ride by and save you. You are wrong, Merlin replied. I could have saved myself. You are the one who is riding to, toward your death, for God is not your friend. The two friends came to an armed knight sitting in a chair by a fountain. I challenge any knight who comes this way to a duel, the knight announced, and so I challenge you. So be it, King Arthur replied. The two men fought fiercely on horseback, breaking their spears to splinters upon one another's shields. When King Arthur reached for his sword, the knight said, It is better if we continue to fight with spears. My squire will supply us with two good ones. The two fought on with the new spears until they too shattered. Again, King Arthur reached for his sword. Let your sword rest, the knight said, for you are the best spearman I have ever encountered. Let us do battle with spears once more, for the love of knighthood. The squire brought two good spears, and the two men resumed their contest. This time, however, King Arthur's spear shattered while the knight's spear remained whole. The knight gave Arthur such a mighty blow upon his shield that he knocked both Arthur and his horse to the ground. Arthur drew forth his sword and said, I will fight you on foot, Sir Knight, since I can no longer fight on horseback. Thus began a new contest, sword to sword, with each knight on foot. They charged one another like two rams until the earth ran red with their blood. Finally, the knight's sword sliced King Arthur's sword into two pieces, and the king was at the knight's mercy. But Arthur quickly leapt upon the knight, threw him to the ground, and removed his helmet. The knight, realizing how vulnerable he now was, summoned all of his strength and overturned Arthur. He removed Arthur's helmet and raised his sword. Before the knight could behead the king, Merlin cast a spell upon him, 
causing the knight to fall into a deep sleep. Merlin then picked up King Arthur and rode off with him on the knight's horse. "'What have you done, Merlin?' Arthur cried. "'Have you killed that knight with your enchantments? He is one of the best knights I have ever fought.' "'I advise you not to worry about him, Arthur,' Merlin replied, "'for he is far healthier than you are. I have simply put him to sleep for a short time. He is indeed a great knight, and from this time forth he will serve you well, as will his two sons. His name is Sir Pellinore.' Merlin took King Arthur to a hermit, skilled in the art of medicine, who healed the king. When they were leaving, Arthur said to Merlin, "'I no longer have a sword.' "'Do not be concerned,' replied Merlin. "'Not far from here you will find a suitable sword.' As they rode together, they came upon a lovely, wide lake. A woman's arm protruded from the middle of the water. It was clothed in a white embroidered silk fabric, and its hand held a beautiful sword." there exclaimed merlin now you can see the sword that i had in mind then they noticed a lady in a boat upon the lake who is that lady arthur asked she is the lady of the lake merlin replied she is coming to speak with you treat her well so that she will give you that sword when the lady arrived king arthur said to her lady what sword is being held above the water by that arm i wish it were mine for i have no sword the lady replied, King Arthur, that is my sword, Excalibur, but I will give it to you if you will give me a gift when I ask for it. I will give you whatever gift you, gift you wish, Arthur replied. Then take my boat and row out to the sword. Take both the sword and its sheath, and I will request a gift of you when I am ready to do so. Once Arthur took the sword and its sheath, the hand and arm withdrew beneath the water. Which do you prefer? Merlin asked. The sword Excalibur or its scabbard? I prefer Excalibur, of course, Arthur replied. Then you are not wise, Merlin responded, for the, sh the sheath is worth ten of the swords. As long as you wear the scabbard upon your body, no matter how wounded you are, you will not lose a drop of blood. So take care of that sheath and always keep it with you. When King Arthur returned to Caerleon, his knights were amazed to hear of his adventure with Sir Pellinore. They were disturbed that he would risk his life in such a way, and yet they were glad to serve a king who would take the same risks they themselves did. The time came when King Arthur said to Merlin, My nobles want me to marry so that I will not leave the throne of Britain without an heir. Whom do you advise? Whom do you love above all others? Merlin asked. Guinevere, the daughter of Sir Leo de Grants, who has in his possession the round table. She is the most beautiful lady alive. If you did not love her as you do, Merlin replied, I would find you another lady whose beauty and goodness would please you. But I can see that your mind is set on Guinevere, and I cannot hope to change it. You are right, Arthur responded, but why would you want to change my mind? Merlin counseled, as beautiful as she is, Guinevere will not be a good wife for you. In days to come, she and the great knight Sir Lancelot will love each other more than they will love you. This prophecy did not deter King Arthur. He sent Merlin and a group of knights to Sir Leo de Grance to request the hand of Guinevere in marriage. Sir Leo de Grance was delighted to have Guinevere marry the King of Britain. Since a dowry of land would be no gift for Arthur, Leo de Grance decided to give him one hundred knights and the round table, which Uther Pendragon had given him. This is a most fitting gift for King Arthur, Sir Leo de Grant said. It will bring peace among all of his knights, since the table has neither a head nor a foot. Whenever the knights meet, their thrones, their services, and their relationship to one another will be equal. King Arthur married Guinevere at Camelot in a solemn ceremony that was followed by a great feast. He appreciated the gift of the round table, which seated 150 knights. When the knights went to sit around the table, each found his name magically inscribed upon the throne that would be his.